This is a 1997 Saab 9000CS, a 2.0-litre injection base model, can you believe it? And it may well be virtually millennial, but its story begins almost two decades previously, when in October 1978, four small but really well regarded companies all came together to try and save money on a new executive car platform and the Type 4 platform was born. Now I'm sure you know the other cars involved, the Alpha 164, the Lancia Thema and the Fiat Chroma and of course the Saab 9000. After six years of development the Saab was one of the first to appear in 1984 and they kind of became the Spice Girls of 1980s motoring. There was Sporty Spice which was the Alpha 164, Luxury Spice which was the Lancia Thema, um, Economy Spice which was the Fiat Chroma and of course Safety Spice which was the Saab. All the manufacturers took their own route to the final outcome, some changing more than others. Alpha completely almost reskinned the entire car so it shares very little with the others. Whereas Fiat and Saab have used very similar body pressings in places. The other three cars all have independent suspension all around using McPherson struts, whereas this uses double wishbones at the front and a solid beam axle at the rear. There was also four wheel drive available in some markets, but not on the Saab. So what do you think of the styling? It was drawn by Gijaro, so it's got a certain elegant minimalist look to it which is yeah very very nice indeed and the later 95 you know kind of echoes the same design aesthetic and theme and as you look around the car you can certainly see where the 95 came from and meanwhile Saab's Bjorn Enval was doing the under the body work making the thing actually work let's take a look around Now normally when I look underneath the bonnet of a Saab, the first thing I expect to see is a turbo. And incredibly, this car doesn't have one. This was specced by someone who actually chose to buy a 2 litre Saab in the biggest body they sold without one. This is a 2 litre direct injection, so it's a 2 litre I. This is Saab's venerable B204. Um, I think it's the H engine, isn't it? I'm sure I'll be corrected in the comments below. Also, if you look at the badges around the back, there's a CD and the CS. The CS is the lift back and the CD is the saloon. Not to be confused with the Vauxhall nomenclature, the Vauxhall naming system, where a CD was the poshest one in the range. Now, like on the Nissan Maxima I drove not so long ago, this has got the full wraparound light and reflector bar in the, in the boot or trunk lid, because I think this is definitely aimed at the American market. It has to be, really. But I, Although I thought it was a bit of a gimmick back in the day, I'm kind of warming to it as it matures into old age. And uh, it's quite a cool feature which definitely sets it apart or makes it a part of its generation. If you look at some of the more recent things like the, uh, the Ford Edge and some of the Dodge cars, they've got that same kind of like a thinner LED strip now, um, which is kind of going back to this design, but in a far more, you know, 2020 style. Inside the boot, this is a very heavy trunk lid, um, I'm not doing my usual climbing in the boot and leaping out because it's so big in there I was actually worried I might get lost. I didn't bring a big enough loaf of bread to leave a trail of crumbs, a trail of, a trail of crumbs. Um, and I could have been gone for days and you'd never see me again which is possibly a good thing. It goes back miles. The seat split 60-40 if you're into that kind of information and there's a ton of space. You even have, have, a, you have a toolbox on the side of the boot. With your this is an emergency fuel release not an emergency get you out of the boot if you've been kidnapped. And uh, a space saver spare under the floor. It's a very practical car. I've just climbed into my 9000 for the first time and having driven lots of other Saabs, I'm fully expecting to find my ignition key down here, but no, this isn't an ignition key. This is a lock for the interior cubby hole, which actually has four cup holders in it. There's two in driving motion deep cup holders and a massive space which is ideally sized for CDs, which I guess were popular in the late 90s. There are also two small cup holders for when you're parked and picnicking. But no, because this car shares its architecture with the Fiat, the Alpha and the Lancia, some of the common parts usage was a steering column, which means your ignition key is in the normal place. How very boring and non-Saab. Now the design language of the interior itself is pure Saab. Um, you have your big, big air vents everywhere. Big one on the driver's side. Another nice one here. Two in the center and all controlled with these nice little rotating dials to give you sort of absolutely perfect control. And like in the 9.5, you've got these, um, I can only describe them as like sliding a deck of playing cards, the way they move and so flow your air. This is ridiculously complicated. I said that before and I stand by it. But as luxury cars go, this is astonishingly basic. Someone went into their Saab dealer and said, I want a 9,000, how much does it cost? They told them how much it cost. And then that person, I either run out of money or refused to spend a penny more because this is as basic as a 9,000 gets. I mean, it's not, you're not living in misery here. You have electric windows, you've got a five speed gearbox, a radio cassette player. Um, but you have nothing else. You could have happily spent a morning ticking boxes in your Saab dealer and you could have had um, 
stability control, cruise control, um, I think a CD player um, in there, air conditioning, a digital clock, so many other, a turbo engine, so many things. But no, this car is absolute basic poverty spec. But if you're in the used market, it does have the advantage that all those things aren't going to go wrong. I mean, you still get electric windows and your electric boot opener and electric mirrors. So, you know, you're, you're touching the future here a little bit. Things you'll notice if you are familiar with the 9000 range is that instead of the digital push button uh, heating ventilation area, you have your old fashioned three dials. And instead of an interesting digital clock or any kind of trip or readout computer, you've just got your basic um, circle dial clock, which actually looks very similar to the ones you find in Fords in the 80s and 90s as well. I'm pretty sure I've seen that in an Orion. Early cars obviously had a glove box. I mean, all cars have glove boxes, don't they? But to comply with new regulations, this car, as a facelift vehicle, has got an airbag where the glove box used to be. To make up for this, you have now got a big um, cubby hole thing here, made of carpet, which is exactly the right size for your book pack and literally nothing else. You have a nice little uh, cloth bag down on the driver's seat and the passenger seat, so you can put small oddments in there. And you have got some fairly big door bins and obviously your big cubby here in the center. There is one mistake not to make. First thing I did when I was looking for the glove box was push this button down here. That does not open the glove box. That is your fuse compartment. So uh, yeah, don't put anything in there. Looking at the buttons and controls, there is a lot of carryover that went from this car through to the 9.5 when it replaced it. Um, not long after, actually, in 1998, the 9.5 replaced this. Things like the heated seat controls and uh, the window controls are all absolutely identical. This button to open the boot is the same button as well. But I've waffled enough. I'll investigate it more when I'm on the road. Let's hit the road and see what this thing is like. Vroom. Well. That's smooth, isn't it? Let's get some a little bit of breeze going because it's quite warm in here. Now there is no air conditioning because this is an absolute base spec car. Now what makes this car special of all the 9000s that are left on the road? of which I don't know how many there are, probably not a huge number if I'm honest, is that this particular one has only got 32,000 miles on it. So it feels virtually, if not like a brand new car, then certainly like a car that's only had one owner before. It helps the two-stroke turbo have fitted a new clutch in it recently. Well, it's for sale there now, so in the pre-sale inspection -y preparation stuff. In my first job, the two directors of the company had Saabs. One had a 900 turbo, the other had a 9000 turbo. And I was just in awe and envy of those cars. They were just so fast, they were so comfortable. They made my little Mark IV or Mark III Escort look like the baggy bit of cheap tin it was. There was something about the 9000 I really couldn't believe, but on a hot day, if I sat in that car, it would blow ice crystals at you. It was astonishing. I was slightly in envy of those vehicles, but I haven't been in one in a long time. I, I think that may have been the last 9,000 I sat in. After driving that 9.5 the other day, I really kind of got into the whole Saab vibe. I really wanted to experience more of it. So I've come to Two Stroke to Turbo in uh, Hertfordshire, the big Saab specialist, where they've got one of the finest 9,000s you can buy at the moment. And I'm taking it for a ride today. This is a 1997 car, so maybe you'd have picked this up in 2000 driving like it does now. And so with that in mind, the suspension is beautifully soft. It's really supple, but this one is a delight. Now one thing which absolutely baffled and really amused me when I was reading it um, in my, during my research about this car is that apparently the seats were inspired by pigs in space from the Muppets. I have literally no idea what that means. If you have any clue, please give me a call because I'm baffled. I do love these little centrally mounted um, window switches. Oh, he just take a handful of them and grasp them just to make the whole lot all fly up together, or, or down possibly. And you can turn off the ones in the back so if you've got annoying children, you can irritate them. 
you can tell this car's been set up for executive travel rather than for you know, out and out 0 to 60 dash back lane performance. The car just kind of floats around in a very, very comfortable manner. A lot of these cars were automatic, being an executive, but also being the 90s, it wasn't the default choice to make everything automatic back then. So thankfully we have a rather nice five-speed manual gearbox in this car. Four-speed auto was an option. It changes quite nicely. It's a little, a little bit notchy, but the oil is still cold. In fact, it's improved as I've driven along. You have to squeeze the little rubber gator thing underneath it upwards to engage reverse, so you can't accidentally hit reverse when you're in motion. I hope you've enjoyed this little run around in a Saab 9000. It's a while since I've been in one, so it's been quite cool to actually uh, reacquaint with it. If you've enjoyed it, please hit like and uh, do hit subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that bell notification down in there in the corner. And it'll let you know when any more new and exciting stuff is hitting the channel. I think it's what you have to say on YouTube, isn't it? I forgot to say without further ado, oh, I can't believe it. I'm gonna get a letter now. Damn, it's the law. If you watch this any YouTube channel, you'll see Without further ado, as I get into the content, what a mistake, I'm in trouble now. Now the impression I'm getting is, because the car gestated from 1978, was launched in 1984, and it survived until 1998, that's 16 years in production and six years in pre-production. That's a 20 year life cycle effectively. And during that time, they obviously updated the car to bring it up to the latest crash regulations, hence the lack of glove box and other things, and facelifted it variously. Um, in some ways, it kind of feels imperceptibly like a much older car, like an 80s car. But because of all the updates, it really does feel still like a 90s car. It's not, it's not um, to the detriment of either of those things. It, it's all still that cohesive, minimalist Scandinavian design just works beautifully on the inside with the Italian Gigaro, Gigaro, I don't know, exterior. The whole thing does just work. My, one of my favourite phrases is uh, fashion fades, style remains. And this is the case here. This is just effortlessly stylish in an understated way. And that does kind of mean that it's not a ridiculously fancy thing that is all folds and creases or fins and chrome that dates instantly. It's just aged and mellowed really quite pleasantly. And it put it alongside the later 9.5 that replaced it. Well, this is a 97 car. The car was officially replaced kind of tail end of 97 into 98. So there's only a few months of production after this. It's not just the carryover components, like the switch gear and things. It's the whole style of the car. You know, overtaking a cyclist, you do notice that lack of punch because the turbo isn't there. Again, you can take this as a positive because, you know, with no turbo hanging off the side of the engine, that's one less thing to break on this car. Now, unlike Saab 999, basically the traditional Saabs that came before it, this is a transverse mounted engine, so as in left to right rather than north-south, where the gearbox mounted on the side of it. So it's very, very normal um, for a Saab. I didn't expect to have any kind of digital readouts and things, but I do have a nice little MPGometer uh, down below the speedo, which as I sort of lift off rises to, well, it's just, just kind of above 55, about 60 mpg. As I'm sort of dabbing the throttle to keep us rolling along, it's saying about 30 mpg, which I, I guess is, you know, acceptable and expected on a car of this size, this engine size, and its generation. So that's all, all good. What am I do? Neither of these options. Okay, now, I wasn't expecting a dual carriageway to be here. But that was a good 0 to 60 test. We're not there yet. You really do notice the difference that a turbo would have made. But it's a lovely smooth motor. It doesn't feel stressed. This car's only got 32,000 miles on it from new. This is as close to driving a new Saab 9000 as you're ever going to get. Oh, I should have stepped on McDonald's and changed my cameras. Thank it. Now on the dual carriageway, the cruise is just blissful. I mean, this is this is so smooth and quiet. I haven't even hit top gear yet. Oh, we go fifth gear. 
I'm getting more wind noise than road or engine noise. This is just gorgeous. This is such a nice place to be. Okay, uh, having driven onto a dual carriageway by mistake, because I prefer to do these tests on small back roads, um, I've taken the GoPros off the outside of the car so they don't fall off, and uh, we now have to pull back into traffic, so we'll have a, another 0 to 60 test, which I was not planning at all. But hopefully there'll be a gap in the traffic any moment now. There's a woman parked in E-Class right in the middle of this long, long thin lay-by. So whereas I could have had a nice long run up to build up speed, I'm gonna have to build up speed in half the length I would otherwise have done. God, is everyone on their lunch or something at the moment? Come on. Come on, so I should go in front of that. It's the slowest thing in the world. Oh, that's not bad, actually. Yeah, a good, smooth, flat surface. That's actually uh, pretty good, 0 to 60. I, mean, I, I think it's about 11 seconds or so. I do have information somewhere, I think it's in the boot. I'll re refer to that in a moment. It gives some accurate information. But from memory, I think it's 11 and a half seconds, not to 60. Oh, the handling. The grip is excellent to the corner. And the handling is um, it's not bad. The car does roll, but it has a good amount of grip and stability. You don't feel like you're gonna lose control. And this is actually very similar to say, the Lancia Thema and the Alpha 164, in so much that you know, they, even though the Alpha is the more sporting of the two, the Lancia still does have good Italian sporting credentials. And this shares those abilities. It's beautifully softly sprung, so it's lovely and comfortable, but at the same time, if you throw it through a corner, the chassis will cope with it and it'll, it'll keep you pointing in the right direction, even if the lean is a little more than you expect in a harder sprung, newer car. There's no unfortunate payoff in that you go spiraling off the road sideways. You will grip, you'll just roll. It's like driving a Rover P6, but with significantly less roll. Now also, with a shared platform, there's kind of an urban myth that you can swap, um, swap doors with a Fiat Chroma, which is, sort of true. In theory you kind of can, the pressings are the same, but there's much more crash protection in the Saab doors and they don't actually fit together so you can't really do that. It'd be lovely to try though, I think Top Gear sort of pretended they were going to but then just welded two cars completely uh, back to front down the middle and didn't even pretend to try and make it work. In fact there is a fair degree of parts commonality between the three car or four cars. In reality, very little is actually cross-compatible. Oh, this is a genius bit of road design. Dual carriageway you've got to cross, but they've let the bushes grow up so far, you can only see about 200 yards down the road. Excellent. You could say being an absolute base model is uh, to its detriment because you've not got all the fun features that make it extra practical, like aircon, which I would like today, it's quite warm. Uh, cruise, uh, ESP, you know, various things like sunroof maybe. But there's less to go wrong. My Alpha, for example, the aircon is broken on that and I've been quoted minimum 500 pounds to repair that. And that's 500 pounds I don't want to spend on a car that costs 2,000. So yeah, from that point of view, you've got more solid basic parts up there these basic heater controls really aren't going to go wrong. That clock isn't never going to drop an LCD pixel because it hasn't got any. Something else I just noticed uh, as a carryover to the 9.5 is this little kind of chrome joysticky lamp in the roof, which quite amused me in the 9.5 as well. The steering's surprisingly light. In fact, the whole car feels light on the road. The whole feeling and impression you get from the car when you're driving is of lightness, of airiness. If you've driven a 164 or a Thema or a, or a Chroma, or if you've seen a Chroma in the last 10 years, <laughs> tell me if you have, because I haven't. It's of lightness, same as those cars. And 
unlike the 900, it felt like you were driving a slab of concrete down the road. This feels light and airy, and it does have that Italian influence to it. Although, if you slam the door on a 164, it doesn't feel anywhere near as solid and reassuring as it does in the Saab, which is, again, a little more hewn than the Italian equivalent. Because there is a commonality of parts and a carryover from, I guess, some of the other platform sharing things, it does have that slightly Italian feel to the ride in, in that it's floaty and it's quite light. But at the same time, when you hit a corner, it's happy to, to go around it and it wants to play. Okay, I'm currently taking it ride through I'm currently taking it for a ride through a tiny village with lots of parked cars and hundreds of school kids kicking out, so it's possibly the worst test drive route I could have imagined. What I need is a dangerously precipitous side of the road that I could maybe fall out of. Thanks dude! I'm just wipe their windows and just utterly wash the car.